Hold on, Here is... start recording. Hold on. Recording is on. Ah, okay. Sorry, I still repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> So here is a quick example to see that you cannot expect to get this stronger localization in the sense of L3 if you don't assume anything at all about your measure. So a simple example is new is just the uniform measure conditioned on the event that x1 is equal to x2 x3 is equal to x4, x5 is equal to x6, etc. If you think about it uh, for a few seconds, even in the sense of measure transportation, this thing will always be distance O of n from any product measure because I always took half my coordinates and just, you know, conditioned them to be something that depends on another coordinate. And it's not also not very hard to see that I can never decompose this measure into measures that look like product measures in the sense of transportation and definitely in the sense of relative entropy. So, it turns out that there is a very na nice natural condition inspired by a paper of Chatterjee and Dembo that does give uh, localization in the stronger sense. And this condition is the following. If d mu is e to the v d mu, so we have this uh, potential v that has the following property. So if the expected supremum or maybe let me write this a bit bigger we take the expectation over gamma which is an n0 identity normal normal vector and we look at the supremum over all x in the hypercube of the scalar product between the discrete gradient of V and gamma. So in other words, we look at the Gaussian width of the logarithmic gradient of the density. If this thing is little o of n, we call this low complexity. And it's in inspired by some other notion of low complexity due to uh, Chatterjee and Dembo. Then, well, there the the following holds true then. I can write this same decomposition. Nu is the integral of nu sub theta dm of theta in a way that with probability one minus little o of one over theta, there exists uh, an actual product measure Xi, this is a really bad Xi, Xi, such that the KL divergence between mu theta and Xi is little o of n. Uh, this is, I'm, all, all of these little o of n's can be actually replaced by stuff which are non-asymptotic but you know i don't want to burden you with more details than necessary and uh, the main application of this is also to mean field approximations and there's also an application to large deviations for uh, random graphs 
but let me not get into this. Uh, let me just comment that there is a related result with a slightly different notion of complexity that followed this result by uh, Tim Austin. And then there was another related result by Fanny Ogiri. Okay, so uh, we've basically seen uh, four theorems, two theorems that have to do with uh, concentration, concentration for quadratic functions, this one, and then uh, some notion of log concavity and concentration for this, for what we call log concave functions, and then two theorems that have to do with this kind of pure state decomposition. And the motivation to put all of these results in the same talk is that the proofs of all of these are, have one essential ingredient, which is the same ingredient. And this is what I'm going to try to explain uh, now. And maybe before I explain it, I don't have so much time, but I think it would be good to uh, explain a slightly different or, or a slightly older idea of localization of measures, which is an idea due to, so I guess you can say both due to Gromov and Millman, and it also, and something related appears in a paper by Lovas and Shimonovitz. And this idea is basically what we're trying to do is the following. Suppose we have a convex body k in r to the n so this is k and let's say we have a one lipschitz test function phi on k and what we want to prove is we want to say we want to upper bound the variance with respect to the uniform measure of k of phi. Okay? So here's one thing we can do. Uh, so phi is def defined on k. Let's, let's take, say, the center of mass of k, this point. And then let me cut k into two halves. I'm going to choose a direction in which I cut. I'm going to just fix this point at the center of mass of k and, and choose theta in the sphere. And by a topological argument, I can always cut k into two halves in a way that the integral of phi will be equal on both halves. So we can always cut k into two smaller convex bodies, k1 and k2. So there exist k1, k2, such that the integral of phi on k1, maybe let's, we can always normalize, we can always add a constant, so assume, that phi just integrates to zero on k. 
Otherwise, just add a constant to make it integrate to zero. So we can always cut into two halves so, so that the integral of phi on k1 is equal to the integral of phi on k2. And by moving the, so, so this I'm not going to explain exactly, but it's also not hard to establish. We can also make sure, let's not cut exactly at the center of mass. Let's do more like a median thing. We can make sure also that the volume of K1 is equal to the volume of K2. Okay? So we can always make this uh, cut in a way that now since we have this condition, this implies that the variance on the uniform measure on K of phi is just the average of the variances on K1 and on K2. So we've basically reduced, given an upper bound on the entire body K, convex body, to given an upper bound on one of the halves chosen randomly. But the point is now that we can keep cutting again and again. We can do this procedure again and again, and it's not very hard to see that we can, we can still do this procedure as long some, somehow there's, if we just cut this thing again and again, here and then here and then here, here, what we're going to end up with, we're never going to end up with a single point because, because of this condition that the integral of phi has to remain invariant. But we're always going to end up with something which approaches a one-dimensional thing. As long as the support is two-dimensional or more, we can always cut to make, the, to make it, in a sense, much smaller. We're, we're, we're only getting stuck when we're getting to something closer to, and closer to a one-dimensional thing. And the induced distribution on, in the limit on this one-dimensional thing is not going to be uniform, but it's going to be log-concave. And this localization procedure basically reduces proving concentration bounds on the entire convex set to proving concentration bounds on one dimensional needles. So we end up with something that looks one dimensional. Or maybe let's just say that we end up with needles, which are basically just one-dimensional measure, measures supported on some one-dimensional interval. And then we just, you know, we, we just have to bound the variance of phi on these one-dimensional things, which is a, an easier task. Okay, so this is like a a general idea, which uh, at least Lovas and Shimonovitz call localization. It has many applications. And what we're, we'll try to do is give an analogous thing to do on the discrete hypercube. Now, of course, on the discrete hypercube, it doesn't make sense at all to do those cuts. Even if we end up with a one dimensional thing, you know, it could be two points which are at a very high distance from each other. So this doesn't seem to make sense. But what we want is to come up with a, maybe a softer or more analytic way of doing this localization, okay? So this is what we're trying to do. And here's what we're actually going to do. So I'm going to define a process that, I don't know, I call it uh, stochastic localization, even though it's a 
Okay, so the name is maybe kind of dumb because, okay, never mind. So let, let me just describe a process in which, so, so here we had some kind of process which we began with some uniform measure on the entire thing. And in each iteration, we had a uniform measure on a smaller and smaller thin. Okay, so here we're all also going to have a measure valued process, but now time is going to be continuous. Okay, and this process is going to be driven by a Brownian motion. So let BT be a standard Brownian motion. in Rn. Maybe before that, let's, let's fix a measure, a probability measure, new, on the discrete hypercube. And we're gonna construct a measure valued process, U sub T, so for every t mu sub t is going to be some probability measure in the following way. So I'm going to construct it by telling you what the density of mu sub t, so I'm, I'm, I'm just going to define d nu sub t at x is some function, sorry, is some function f sub t of x d nu. So we just have to tell you how these functions evolve in time and they're going to evolve according to the following equation. So I'm going to say that f sub zero at x is just equal to one for all x and dft of x. So ft is going to satisfy the following uh, stochastic differential equation. It's going to be equal to ft of x, x minus some process we call at, CT dBT, where AT is the center of mass of new T, and CT is some process adapted to the Brownian motion. CT is a matrix valued process adapted to BT. So what is this thing doing exactly? Let's try to um, understand. So if you feel uncomfortable with stochastic differential equations, what we're really doing here is we're choosing a random gradient and at every iteration, at every infinitesimal iteration, we're just multiplying our density by a linear function whose gradient has some infinitesimal normal distribution. So if you like, we can just, you can just understand it like this, f at time t plus dt at x is just equal to ft at x times a linear function, which is, which looks like this one. So it's a linear function that's equal to zero with the center of mass and its gradient has the distribu a normal distribution centered and with covariance matrix CT squared. Uh, that's it. Okay, it's actually CT transposed CT, but let's say that this CT is also symmetric. It doesn't matter so much. 
and then it's it is squared. Okay. So at every iteration, we have our density, and we just keep multiplying by linear functions. This is this replaces ideologically what happened here. It, where we multiply the indicator by indicators of half spaces. So linear functions are like a soft version of indicators of half spaces, if you like. Okay, this is why maybe this is a bit analogous to what happened over there. And uh, let's try to understand first. So, so first, Two simple properties. So first of all, for all, for every subset of the discrete hypercube, if I look at new T of A, well, this density here by this equation is clearly a martingale. So the measure of every set is also clearly a martingale. Ah, uh, what's, uh, okay. Okay, this is the first property. The second property which you can, I mean, you can do the calculation, but I'll just hand wave. Since I'm multiplying by a function that's equal to one at the center of mass, this addition, so any linear function which is zero at the center of mass, always integrates to zero. So I'm al always adding things that integrate to zero, which means that I'm keeping my density a probability density. I'm never changing the mass. So mu t is almost surely a probability density. For every t. Okay, so it's a, an evolution of probability densities. And now let's try to get some intuition of why this thing is actually localizing my measure on something smaller. Why, why do we call this a localization? I mean, it's just mu multiplication by linear functions. Why do we expect the measure to be become more localized in you know, whatever sense you want. So here's, um, here's a simple calculation. So the first one is, so let me, let me remind you that we denoted by AT the center of mass of the measure, nu T. And we can, just calculate the, dif the Edo differential of AT. So what is D of AT? It's just, well, it's the integral. It's D of the integral of X, F, T, X, D nu by definition. And then I can go back to the definition of D of F, T. And what I'll see, is that if I put the D inside the integral, I, I get the integral of X and then I still have F T X, but I also have this X minus A T C T D B T D nu. And if I write this a bit differently, so this ftx together with d nu is d nu t. So this is just equal to the integral of x minus a t, tensor power two, uh, d nu t. So this is a matrix and I have to multiply this matrix by c t d b t. And what is this matrix? Well, this matrix is just the covariance matrix of nu t. So 
the center of mass of nu t moves in a tractable way. You just take the covariance matrix and multiply it by this. So this already suggests that if in some directions the covariance is large, my center of mass is going to be moving fast in these directions, which means that the process is made, this, this martingale process is making decisions more quickly in directions where I have bigger covariance. Okay, it, it kind of tends to shrink those directions faster. More formally, maybe it's better to just try to understand what is the differential of the covariance matrix of the new T. Okay, we can also do ITO and try to understand what happens here. So, well, this is the differential of the second moment matrix. Minus the differential of the center of mass to the cent tensor power two. But the tensor, the center of mass is a martingale. And also this guy is a martingale because we, because of, you know, this fact. So what we get is that this thing is equal to some martingale term, which we don't care about so much plus a drift term that looks like, well, let, let, let me just write it like this. So it's D A. If you don't like quadratic variations, it's just, I mean, I'll just give you a di different expression for what you get here. Can you hear me well, by the way? It just said my connection is unstable. Okay. So what you get here is basically the covariance of nu t uh, times c t squared times, again, the covariance of nu t dt. Okay. So this is just a calculation. I mean, it's pretty easy to do, but it's already saying something. It's basically saying, well, look at the covariance matrix of your process. It shrinks. So for example, if CT is just the identity matrix, then here we get the, the square of the covariance matrix, which means that if I have some directions with a large covariance, these directions shrink pretty quickly. Okay, so, so if CT is just the identity, then this thing just, uh, the, the, the matrix satisfies the so-called Riccati equation. The, the, you know, the differential is just the square of the function. And if we, so if CT is the identity, then by Granwell's inequality applied to, to this differential we calculated, what we get is that the covariance of nu t, or at least the expected covariance of nu t, is always dominated by one over t times the identity. So no matter, you know, you could have had very, very bad directions. Those bad directions are very quickly tamed. They become much better. Okay, so, and, and, and this is really the simple idea behind this decomposition theorem. So, uh, okay, you now see me. So, this, this decomposition theorem that tells you that you can decompose into measures whose covariance is kind of nice is basically you just run this process and it turns out that you can also differentiate the entropy with respect to time. And you just follow these two processes and you see that as long as you have some big directions, 
of covariance, the covariance somehow shrinks much faster than the entropy shrinks. So, and, and, and maybe, I mean, the, the intuition for this is not, I mean, is not very surprising because if I have some measure, if my measure new is, for example, supported mostly on these two sets, and these two sets are very far apart, then what happens is when I'm multiplying my thing by a linear function with a random gradient, you'll, you'll see that the measure of both these sets is the martingale, but if they're very far away, the more far away they are, the quicker the martingales are going to move, which means I'm, I'm going to make faster decisions about whether I'm, you know, here, or here. Okay, I see there is a question in the chat. Yes, exactly. So, so, I mean, exactly as uh, Jean Christophe said, the, I, the the time you stop the process has to do. So, so the matrix C T will depend on the matrix L, and also the stopping time is going to depend on the matrix L. That's right. Um, good, and, and now let's go back to this idea here with, so now suppose, let me erase this, now suppose that in addition to the measure, we also have a test function phi such that the integral of phi d nu is equal to zero. And I somehow want to keep the integral equal to zero with respect to my localization process. Well, this is actually not so hard because now, now I'll just hand wave the calculations, but they're all very easy. I can look at the differential of the integral of phi with respect to nu t. I mean, this is just, I, I can just use the formulas over here to get that this is going to be equal to some vector vt dot the matrix ct dbt. So this, I don't care so much about what this vector is. This is just what comes out and actually it's not surprising at all because I know this is gonna be a martingale. So if this is gonna be a martingale, it must have a form kind of like this. And we can always choose ct so that ct times vt is zero. So we, we can choose ct so that may, maybe just think of ct as the projection on the orthogonal complement of this vector vt. So, we're somehow doing the localization in all the directions except one direction. And this is a way to keep the integral of phi uh, constant. In this way, if we define the martingale mt to be just the integral of phi d nu t. Okay, so actually this is, this is a bit dumb. I mean, this way I just made it constant. So maybe let's, let me just write the conclusion so that what we have is that the variance with respect to nu of phi is just the expectation of the variance with respect to new t of phi for every t. Just because I kept the integral the same, so 
and 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 the and you know and the the second moment is a martingale right this is because since the integral of phi squared in ut is a martingale So this means if I want to have an upper bound on this, it's good enough to get an upper bound on the variance of phi, not with respect to the original measure, but with respect to some localized thing. And now let me just give you the final idea of the proof of concentration. I mean, there are like maybe the one more idea, it's not the final idea, but. So here's another cal calculation. Re recall that d nu t is f t d nu. So f t is just the density of nu t with respect to nu. And d f t of x is f t of x x minus the center of mass c t d b t. So now by Ito's formula, we can calculate d log of f t. You will soon see why this is useful. So you know, I just use Ito's formula for this and what i get is dft x over ft x minus one half d the quadratic variation over ft square i just took two derivatives of log and this is just equal to the following thing so this ft cancels out with the ft here and the ft squared here and I just get the following thing. I get x minus 80 dBt minus, uh, maybe let me write this here so I have more space, minus ct x minus 80 square one half dt. In particular, you see that this is just a quadratic function in x. So that log of ft is always a quadratic function in x, which means that ft is just the exponential of some quadratic function. It's actually, you know, a pretty nice and tractable thing, this process is not doing so much, but the nice thing here is that this can, this means that ft of x can it always has the form e to the sum vector vt dot x minus a quadrat, the quadratic thing. Well, I can always write it like this, just ct just sorry, the integral between zero and t of ct squared like this, up to some normalizing constant, right? I just, I just opened this uh, norm and I took the quadratic form outside and then I have this linear term which actually don't care what it is so much. And the idea now is that this quadratic matrix, which we can control, right? The only constraint we had about the quadratic matrix so far, let me just remind you, is that uh, this constraint. So we had this constraint, some rank one constraint about CT for every T. Other than that, we can choose CT however we like. And it's not very hard to see that if we define J sub T, so maybe 
let me just remind you that d nu was a quadratic form i dropped the one half it doesn't matter so much i can just define j, j sub t as j minus the integral between zero and t of ct square cs square ds. I can basically always choose my matrix C, so it just cancels out all of the positive directions of J, but I do have a rank one constraint, so I always end up, I can always end up in a way that J at some stopping time will be a rank one matrix. So we can make sure that J at some stopping time tau will be, will have rank one. Just by choosing CT to be, you know, basically the indicator, like the projection onto all of the positive directions of J, except this direction of where I can't have, where I can't be positive. This is basically the idea. And this implies, so a conclusion is, well, this needle decomposition lemma analogous to what we saw above. So this is basically the main step in the work with uh, Freddie and Offer. So the lemma it basically says the following, if D nu is e to the v, e to the, sorry, e to the x, j x plus h x. So for any quadratic function like this, and let's also assume that j is positive definite, it doesn't matter because I can always add an idea a copy of the identity and it doesn't change anything, right? The diagonal terms don't matter. Then there ex ah, uh, then for every phi, for every test function phi on the discrete hypercube, there exists a decomposition, there exists a measure m on Rn times Rn such that mu can be written as this decomposition into W, maybe alpha, beta, dm, alpha, beta, such that W sub alpha and beta is just this Thing that looks like this. So it's just e to the uh, alpha dot x square plus beta dot x. So it's just a, you know, rank one uh, quadratic potential plus a magnetic field. So I have this nice decomposition so that m almost surely we have that the integral of phi d w alpha beta uh, is just equal to zero or sorry it's just equal to the original integral of phi d nu and also, I know that the rank one thing is not too large. So the size of the vector alpha is at most the size of the operator norm of the matrix J. So if you want, this is an analog to needle decomposition. We're decomposing into those needles. We're taking a measure which is 
not super tractable. It's a quadratic form, but we know that those are not super tractable here. And we decompose them into, you know, much more tractable stuff. And for those things, it's already known that you have a Poincaré inequality. So basically, by this lemma, the, the original measure automatically inherits the concentration inequalities you have for these measures. And yeah, it's a perfect time to stop. So thanks. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ronan, for a fascinating two hours of lectures. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, either raise your hands in the chat or, um, sorry, raise your hand in the participant list or, or ask the question in the chat. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll ask one just to keep us going for the moment. So um, you mentioned applications to large deviations for random graphs. Could you say just a little bit more about how this stuff applies there? Yes, let me go back up there. So um, just to put things short, suppose, for example, you have, uh, so, so let, let me first say this is one result which makes, among, among a series of many results which make progress rest in these directions due to uh, Chatterjee, Dembo, Ojuri, uh, Varadhan, and many others. So, but, but the idea is the following. Uh, you have, suppose you have the erdos rani GNP graph, and you condition it to have many more triangles than what you expected. Okay, you, uh, you condition it to have twice the number of triangles than the expectation. It's not very hard to show, to show that this is not very different instead of this, you know, uh, cutoff conditioning, you, you could do a softer thing, a, a softer thing. You could multiply the density by e to the number of triangles times some function, okay? And, and, and then you can think about this as a, as a measure. So, so this is a measure on the space of graphs, but you could also think about this as a measure on the discrete hypercube, okay? And what we wanna say about this measure is, first of all, I'm, for example, we want to, to estimate the entropy of this measure or the associated partition function which is usually a hard task. But if you know, but, but then for this, you have uh, a kind of a standard technique, which tells you that uses the so-called Gibbs variational principle that tells you that something like the log of the partition function is the supremum over all measures of the, of the potential integrated with respect to the measure minus the entropy of the measure, something like this. And the point is, if you have such a decomposition, then you know that you can basically replace the supremum by a supremum that only considers product measures. Okay, so this, this is something that Chatterjee and, and Dembo originally did in their paper. And this, this results just gives slightly, like a slightly stronger result in, in terms of the conditions you have to verify so that here you will only need to consider product measures. Thank you. I can't see any other questions coming. Oh, here's one from Yogeshwaram. Um, let me just try and unmute him um, and he can ask it himself. Uh, uh, by determinant probability measures, do you mean determinantal processes or I'm... Hello, uh, uh, Ronin? Yeah. Yeah, so okay. I was wondering, uh, instead of the easing measure, if you take some other uh, probability measures, uh, I mean, Bodino and uh, Borschmidt consider spin systems more general, right? Yes. So, uh, so in in particular, if you if you if if you look at determinal determinantal uh, processes, so this is 
I, is that is this the family where you were you wanted to ask about? Yeah, in particular, but um, so, generally so what the terminal processes actually you can say much better things about, and for this, I guess you should start from this paper by uh, Anari Liu, yeah, okay. of Aisgan and Vincent. Uh, so this is a mar much more algebraic condition and it implies like, a, it, it does imply spectral gap and other things. Maybe uh, let me also mention a related paper by uh, Paris and uh, Pimentel which uh, who prove that if you have some condition called uh, strong Rayleigh, which is implied by which those determinant probability measures have, then you automatically have uh, some strong concentration and all sorts of other nice things. So for this, this was uh, already known. Okay, thank you. Okay, I can't see any other um, any other questions coming up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop recording, and then I'm going to suggest that we um, 